Most of you are probably familiar with uh, Tweed Studios in Athens, Georgia, and uh, they have been, one, it's just an incredible facility, uh, and the group of professionals that they have brought together in Athens, uh, not just as a professional recording space, but as a teaching space for people who are interested in music production and recording um, is pretty unheard of. He had brought together a group of professionals from, you know, really all over the country. And, and, and now with Charlie here, people who have been literally all over the world working in music production and music recording. And they're right here in, in Athens, Georgia. And, um, and certainly there's been a kink thrown into their plans with how COVID has developed um, and what they've got planned, uh, not just for the Athens community, but really uh, nationally and regionally for people who are interested in doing this. So most recently they have brought in uh, our guest tonight, Charlie Chastain, uh, who actually started once upon a time here in Athens at the University of Georgia um, before uh, he went uh, to Tempe, Arizona where he completed a, a master of recording program at the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Science uh, out in Arizona. Uh, after that, uh, he would move to New York City uh, where he became uh, a Pro Tools engineer at Clinton Recording Studios uh, and in the, the, the huge music scene of New York City between jazz, pop, Broadway was really immersed uh, in that whole, all aspects of production and recording with Pro Tools. Uh, and then after that would move to Europe and I guess uh, a lot of around kind of Eastern Europe, Russia, and did some really amazing uh, experiences there, uh, recording and working with musicians in very, I guess you could say unique spaces um, before uh, coming back uh, over to the States not long ago where he was on the faculty at SAE uh, in Atlanta uh, before, uh, they were able to get him over to Tweed Studios in Athens. Um, and now that he's in uh, in Athens, I'm certainly excited to see him there. I've had a chance to meet him earlier. Um, and it's just uh, a wonderful resource. And uh, along with Charlie and the rest of Tweed, they have just been incredibly uh, generous in offering uh, their time and offering their resources and their expertise uh, to really any teacher, but particularly in Gwinnett County because you know, we have such a concentration in music technology is, is such a big part of what we do. Uh, but we're certainly grateful uh, for them uh, agreeing to be here tonight. Charlie, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, guys. I hope everybody can hear me. Everybody hear me good? Great. Okay. Um, well, yeah, great introduction. Thank you. Um, you're very kind. Um, as always, happy to happy to be a part of Tweed and happy to be a part of an organization that that values um, helping educational institutions beyond our doors, such as those in Gwinnett County. I'm happy to be here. Um, when he told me one of the topics, you know, tonight, I really got excited. Um, he said DIY. That's all it took, and then I was I was completely in, and and I'll tell you why. So, given my diverse background. Um, one of the reasons why Tweed decided to hire me, I believe, I hope, was that I was kind of able to bridge the gap between the commercial recording studios of yesteryear and the more modern uh, home studio market, the more, you know, production facilities in your back, you know, closet or whatever. And, um, and they needed somebody who could help kind of bridge that gap. And I just out of you know, chronology, I, I was lucky enough to begin my career in those commercial studios, such as Clinton Recording Studios, Right Track in New York City, uh, Doppler in Atlanta, um, Abbey Road Studios in, in London. You know, I've worked in these facilities, you know, that basically you have anything and everything you want. You can achieve whatever sonics you want. Um, but then I, I transitioned into Europe and truly, truly fell in love with making music in non-conventional spaces. I really tried to embrace that in everything that I did. Um, and to be honest, now when I'm in a studio, a real commercial studio, even Tweed, I feel a little bit out of place because it's too easy, you know? And, um, and so I think in, in certain ways, you know, that, that DIY mindset probably would be very valuable to you as teachers 
trying to produce music out of your classrooms, noisy classrooms with all kinds of sonic anomalies and all kinds of challenges. And so when we talked, when we were, you know, when I was brainstorming this DIY thing, yeah, I want to introduce you to a few, a few items that I use all the time. And it came out of, of a result of learning how to, how to work in non-conventional spaces. But even more than that, I just want to start off by saying, you know, yeah, that's a heartbreaking story about the discouragement that, that some of you are feeling right now, trying to teach some of these concepts remotely. Uh, yeah, I can't even imagine. And, you know, and, you know, I'm standing beside you and, and rooting you on. And, uh, and I can understand when, when all this came down last year, I was actually still working at SAE. And so I had to teach, you know, the remaining eight weeks of a semester online trying to teach mixing. It, it's very difficult um, in, in a, you know, in a college level course like that. And, and so I can, I can understand, but hopefully some of the things and the insights that I provide tonight will be valu valuable to you. So yeah, let's talk about that mindset first. Um, the mindset that I'm talking about is on one hand, I, I imagine you as music tech teachers, you want to inspire your students. And so you may go on Google Images and you may find, you know, pictures of these grand recording studios, these gorgeous studios with big, you know, big recording consoles and nice monitors and, you know, every mic in the world. Um, and then, you know, say, if you really love music tech, you could do this. But then you turn around and you're like, but we're still in this classroom. Let's make music. In a, in a lot of ways, it kind, it kind of could almost kind of kill the joy. You know, and so what I've found is kind of flip that a little bit. And what I do is I try not to talk about all the fancy romantic stuff so much. And I really focus in on what do we have in front of us? That includes the space, the sonic space, the tools that we have, even, even our talent, our individual talents. What do we have here? Let's see how far we can push those individual elements. And what I've found is that when students really buy into it, and when they really embrace that DIY, DIY mindset, um, some amazing things happen. And so I would definitely encourage you to try to instill that mindset from day one when you're, when you're working with your music tech students, because I think it, I think it, really, uh, it really gives them something to be inspired for, because all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, we did that here with this stuff? And all of a sudden, you know, you're, they're off and running. Um, and so that mindset, I think, has been crucial for me because one of the things that I'm known for as a producer, you know, working, you know, working in an old rundown Soviet bread factory or 15th century farmhouses in central France or wherever the weird places I've worked, um, you know, when the artist says, I want to do this, they probably were expecting me to say, oh, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, let's try you know and you'd be amazed at some of the things that come out just by having that open mindset now granted there's lots of times when things go and just completely explode in your face but at least now you know right um and so um having that mindset i think is going to be crucial for you for you guys and so one of the things um so let's talk about some of these different tools and things like that first of all your space you know, I'm imagining that most of you, it's your, it's your classroom, your music room. Um, obviously, you've got sound isolation issues. You've probably got all kinds of flutter echo from things bouncing off of glass and off of concrete and, you know, whatever. So, obviously, you may or may not have the budget to address some of that. If you do, obviously, there's um, lots of good things that you can do. You can build your own bass traps. Um, this is probably Charlie's home studio version 9.6 or something like that after all the studios that I've built all over the world where I've lived. Um, but if you guys ever want information on how to do that, how to build sound panels, how to build bass traps, how to build um, basic broadband diffusion, you know, as a project that you could do with your students, I'd be happy to show you how to do that because most everything that I employ in my facilities, in my home studios, I've built myself just out of sheer necessity. Um, but beyond that, one of the easiest things that you have that's freely available to you is the handy dandy moving blanket, you know. So 
just the normal moving blanket like you can get at Home Depot or uh, Harbor Freight or Lowe's. Uh, sometimes they look like this, you know. Why is that important? You'd be amazed at how much, uh, how much you can make a sound source sound tighter by surrounding the recording area with a few of those. And what you can do is you can take a, just an average boom stand, you know, that's got the boom thing on it. Just make it to a T and then take, um, take the blankets and drape them over it and then surround your source. And all of a sudden, what you're doing is you're not eliminating, you know, all that extraneous noise, but you're definitely lowering it and you're definitely tightening up the sound around it. And you'd be amazed at how much better you can, the sonics you can achieve. Uh, now, obviously, I'm talking in the context of recording actual moving air. I know for a lot of you in some of your classes, most of everything you're doing is in the box, is already using samples and things like that. Uh, I'd encourage you to find opportunities to step out of that inside the box electronic and pull out mics, even if they're bad mics. And the reason why is once again, sometimes your students will get super stoked when they hear their own voice or when they hear something they performed, you know, versus just hitting a, you know, a MIDI keyboard and having, having a pre-selected sound. Um, you'd be surprised at how inspired they get sometimes with that. Or maybe, you, maybe you've already been doing this. Maybe you're not surprised. Um, so first, the, the moving blanket. It sounds like a little thing, but it's a huge thing. And so my poor wife, you know, we have literally traveled with about 45 moving blankets over the years. She's like, why are we keeping these? And that's why I always have them at the ready because you never know when I may need them for some sort of weird recording project. All right, so that's the first one. Um, the next one, when we're talking about a space that maybe is not, you know, the best for recording moving air, uh, another thing that you got to factor in is the type of mic you use. I would highly suggest using uh, dynamic mics first and foremost. Second, if you didn't, if you don't want to use dynamic mics, you could use ribbon mics, and finally, you could use condenser mics. Um, condenser mics are the more fancy, romantic-looking ones. They're the, you know, the the Neumann U87 kind of looking, fancy condenser mic things. Um, the problem with that is, imagine it this way: if you got a really crappy room, and you put an eight thousand dollar mic up in the room you're going to have an $8,000 $8, recording of a crappy room, right? Okay, so what you would do instead is use mics that maybe dole out some of that sound, you know, that maybe wouldn't capture everything so accurately as a condenser mic. And that's where the handy-dandy dynamic mics come in. My favorite dynamic mic of all, of all time is the Shure SM7. I hope you can see it there. Um, it's probably one of the more expensive um, dynamic mics, but the thing about this mic that's so amazing is it's very rich and it gives some of that richness and quality kind of like a condenser does. And two, because of the, because of the dynamic nature of it, you can get right up on it and it does really good at isolating other things. And so if you needed to, you could reach getting really close and capture a source and you'd probably have it pretty isolated. Um, you know, one of the, one of the claims to fame about this particular mic too, is this was the mic that was used on the whole Thriller album. So every time you hear Michael Jackson's voice, it was coming out of this little $300 mic. You know, he had access to, you know, $15,000 mics, but that's what he sang out of. Uh, and so I own a few of these and I love these, these mics. All right. 